Hello, uh, welcome to the next session, uh, Introduction to User Experience Design for Developers. Uh, I am Jeff LeBlanc, and I will be taking you through this session. A uh, quick introduction for myself. Uh, I am the user experience guy at Integrated Computer Solutions. Uh, in fact, I head up a, a team of very proficient designers. Uh, but I've, before that, I've been a software developer for most of my career. Uh, I've spent a lot of time doing programming. And in fact, I was actually the first North American certified QT trainer back in 2003. Uh, in fact, I've been doing it so long since it was QT before it's become cute, and that's kind of wired into my head, so I will be probably calling it QT in, instead. You'll, you'll have to bear with me on that. Um, but nowadays, I mainly focus on user experience, and I have the opportunity to run a team to do presentations such as this, uh, and to teach it at a graduate level at one of the local universities. So today, I'll be giving you a, a little bit of a sample of some of the material that I give to my grad students, uh, specifically with a focus on some tips and tricks that you folks can all take back to your desks when you get back on Monday and hopefully start integrating right into the software that you're working on. So a couple of quick questions just by show of hands. This is as much to make sure that everybody's kind of woken up from their food coma from lunch as anything. So as developers, who in here has, has coded a user interface because they actually like coding user interfaces, because you like doing GUI programming? Fair amount, actually, more, more so than usual. Next question is how many of you have coded a UI because you've got a really cool piece of back-end software and, and damn it, you need to slap a UI on it so the other users can actually use the thing? And more hands go up, which is usually the case. So. You know, for you folks who are, who are back-end programmers, uh, I'm here to tell you, and I'm sorry to say that while your work is important, it's the UI that makes the sale. And you really need to care more a little bit about it, and I'm going to tell you why. So QT and QML, obviously very powerful toolkits, and we're all here for these few days to hear about what the latest and greatest things are and, and what they can do for us. But by nature, as they're software toolkits, they focus on how, and when we're developing software, that's what we think about. How do I do this? How do I solve this problem? How do I create something? They don't really give you much in the way of guidelines in terms of what it is that you're going to create. And the users of the software, the people who are out in the streets or out in the desk, you know, at their desktops or driving in their cars, they care about what the software does. You know, what, what can they do with it? What, thing, how, what value does it add to their lives? What your application does is more important to the end user than how it's doing it. They don't care that it's QT under the sheets or JavaScript or you know, C Sharp or whatever it might be. They care about what it's going to do for them. Right? So this makes a difference for you because you have to start thinking not just about the how, but the what. Interesting little factoid for you. If you're working on mobile application development, a lot of mobile apps are free. You go to the store, you download them. That's great. You've got 30 seconds from the time that the user downloads the app onto your phone, launches it, and tries to do something with it for it to grab their attention and for have them go, oh, yeah, this is cool. I want to keep using this. If they're not impressed in 30 seconds, you know, all those months of, of programming that you've put into this is for naught because they don't care. They want to know what it's going to do for them right now. And that first impression, that what we call the visceral impact, that's user experience. That's what makes somebody want to use your application. It makes them want to keep using it. And this is particularly important, it makes them want to recommend it to other people. You know, you want to be the person writing the app that people are talking about going, hey, I just tried this new really cool thing. Have you heard about it? Do you want to try it? You should check this out. It's, it's really neat. That's the goal. So you need to care about these things. Design really makes a difference. <clears throat> and both good and bad makes a difference. Um, the picture I have up on that slide is from a book called The Human Factor. Uh, it's by uh, a Professor Kim Vicente, and it gives some really, really scary stories about what happens when software or systems are designed badly. 
Bad design adds stress to people's lives. If you've ever used a piece of software that you haven't liked, but you've been forced to use it, and you're really gnashing your teeth along the way going, why did they do this? Oh, this is so hard to use. Well, somebody thought it was a good idea, but it's stressing you out. Bad design is problematic. From a business perspective, if you've got your sales and marketing hat on, your users are your customers, and you might be losing customers. Worst case scenario, and the, this book really goes into this, bad design can cost lives. Um, for anybody who attended my training yesterday, I opened the training with a discussion about the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster in the United States. The official cause of that, and it was back in the 70s, but the official cause was listed as human error. And if you look into the, the in-depth analysis of it, the problem was it was an error, all right, but it was by the designers of the control room. The, the controls were laid out in such a way that it was basically impossible for the operators to know what was going on when the meltdown happened. Design matters. So good design, the opposite of this, it improves people's lives. It makes it easier for them to do their jobs. It reduces their stress. And again, if you're working on a mission critical system, like a nuclear plant, or um, a piloting control system, or a vehicle control system, or a medical device, that design can save lives. So excellent book. I highly recommend you check it out. So user experience, <clears throat> it's something you want to focus on. Um, from a purely business perspective, by increasing the customer satisfaction, you might also hear this referred to as uh, CX, customer experience, this is good for business, it increases revenue. Uh, there was a study done by Wixon and Jones where they showed that uh, one particular company's focus on UX gave them an 80% boost on revenue just by focusing not on new features, but on the usability of the existing features. Right? Focusing on, on UX makes business sense. It reduces training costs, it reduces support costs. It just generally makes it easier for the software to get out into the field and for you know, the organization to not have to worry about it. McAfee, okay, they do antivirus software. You wouldn't think about a company like that doing much with user experience, but they have their little settings, dialogues, and things that happen when viruses come up. Um, 2005, they spent time focusing just on, again, the usability, even for their limited set of dialogue boxes. They dropped their support calls by 90%. If you're the product manager, you're doing a dance in the aisle for a set type of a statistic. Right? Those are the things that you can get by focusing on the design. Now, you'll hear user experience and user interface both talked about, and you know, every piece of software has an interface to it. Just by definition, by definition, it's software, somebody's using it, they're a user, there's an interface. Experience is a little bit different. Experience is, it's a little more subjective. It's how do you feel after you've used it? And as engineers, you might kind of raise an eyebrow about that, but think about it for a second. Again, going back to the example that I said of, have you used a bad piece of software that it really stressed you out? You know, stress is a feeling. So, the idea of a positive user experience means that you didn't dislike using it, or even better, you enjoyed using it. And again, more importantly, you would recommend it to other people. Say, hey, try this out. I'm glad we got this system. Uh, you should try it too. You know, that's a positive experience. So the question becomes, with all the other things that you guys have to do as developers, can you spend time focusing on the design of the front end of it? Well, you can, and you're going to get mixed results, okay, quite honestly. And remember, I've, I've been a programmer for over 20 years, so I've been the guy doing the coding, right? The interesting thing about engineers, and this is going to sound obvious, but yeah, we think like engineers. We like fixing things. We like creating things. Um, we have a very particular, what's called mental model of how we approach the world and how we want to deal with things. This is a different skill set and it's a different approach to the world than a user experience designer has. When engineers do UX design, and you should Google uh, Dilbert user interface, you'll get some really interesting results, which I was told I couldn't use for this presentation, but they're fun to look at anyway. Um, when an engineer designs an interface, very often, not always, but often, you get an interface that only makes sense to other technical people. 
And sometimes that's okay. Maybe you're designing something that's going to be used by physicists to find the next uh, boson particle. Okay? But if you're not, if you're designing software that's going to be used out in the mass market, that becomes a problem. Ask yourself, you know, could my grandmother use this software? Okay. Is your grandmother a valid possible user of this software? You know, a lot of systems I hear, who's the target user? Oh, anybody. Okay, could your two-year-old use it? Could your six-year-old use it? Could your 80-year-old grandfather use it? And then the engineers kind of twitch a little and say no. But that's the type of thing you have to think about. There was a quote from back in the 70s by a gentleman named Fred Hansen, know thy user, for you are not them. And it is really one of the fundamental principles of user experience design. Know who it is that you're designing for, know how they think, know what they're expecting, and design for them as much as you can. Right. So <clears throat> if you're doing user experience design as, as an engineer, if this is just one more thing that's been put on your plate, okay, all is not lost. There are certainly some things that you can do, and some of them are actually very easy, that will bring your game up and kind of take care of at least some of the low-hanging fruits that might be out there for user interface design. Keep in mind, right, again, you are not the target user. So if you get a chance to talk to somebody who's a little closer to the target user than you are in terms of age, education level, um, technological experience, whatever it might be, do so. Try to put yourselves in their shoes, or even better, get out and try to observe them like out in the field doing whatever it is that they do. You'll learn a lot. If you have the opportunity to work with a user experience designer, okay, somebody that's just trained in usability, take them up for it. They have a, a different mindset, they have a different view of the world. It's their job to put themselves in the shoes of the users and be their champion. And what I'm gonna give you here is a set of user interface implementation guidelines that you can apply to whatever software that you're creating right now. The interesting thing is, honestly, it is just as easy to write a front end using some of these principles and just keeping them in, line, in, uh, in mind, do the right thing as it were, as it is to write them the wrong way and do something that doesn't make sense to the user. This is not a lot of extra work for the most part. So, what I'm gonna present here is a set of eight golden rules for interface design. Uh, these came from a gentleman, uh, Professor Ben Snyder, he, or Schneiderman. He is one of the rock stars in the user experience field, and he came up with this set of eight guidelines, and it's a good list. There are other lists out there. You might see some from uh, Jacob Nielsen. He's got a list of 10 that's also very, very good. Um, I just, when I learned these rules, these are the eight that I used and I've internalized them. So these are the ones that I kind of live by. Number one, strive for consistency. Consistency can be just simply within the product that you're working on, okay? If you've got two dialog boxes and one has okay cancel, the other has cancel okay, that's a problem, okay? There's no reason for that. So look at, the pro look at the piece of software that you're writing in a big picture sense. Try to find all the things that are inconsistent and just fix them. So consistency within a product, consistency within multiple products across your company. That gives you a look and feel that you can brand. Marketing departments love that stuff. And just look at other pieces of software that might live within the ecosystem that you're working in. Right, if you're working on a piece of desktop software and you have something that has a copy function and it has a shortcut, it damn well better be Control-C because that's what every other piece of software in the world uses. Don't vary unless you have a really good reason to do so. Consistency helps the users. Once they learn something, they transfer it to whatever it is that they're using now and it just makes their lives easier. Unfortunately, this is probably the most violated rule in software just because it's not thought about. Or, you know, I've, I've literally heard engineers go, oh, what does it matter? Well, again, it matters if you're the end user. So it's just as easy to put the buttons in the right order. <clears throat> you know, this uh, picture here is from uh, an older version of the Microsoft Office Suite. This is when they were doing the, the ribbons. Whether you like it or not, it's at least consistent, right? If you, you look at all these and you say, yeah, okay, I, I see these came from the same company. They're from the same suite of software, and if I figure out how to use one of these, I will probably be able to nicely figure out how to use the rest of them. So that's consistency. 
Next one is designing for what we call universal usability. And this is a big one. The idea is to design the software keeping in mind the widest range of reasonably possible users. Okay, again, you can't just say, oh, this works for everyone. You know, that's from age one to age 100. That's generally not realistic, right? So what is the reasonable range? You know, if it's voting software, at least in the United States, it's 18 plus. So okay, that's a set of parameters that you can put on it. But there are also a lot of other things that you, you need to think about. <clears throat> there are users with, you know, different physical abilities or disabilities. Vision is a big one. As we get older, and this is just a fact of life, our, our eyes get older and uh, they get worse and it gets harder to see. I had somebody in my class yesterday, I'm, I'm going to pick on you, I hope you're not in the audience, um, who made a comment about, oh, the user could be anybody between 30 and 50, it doesn't really matter. Well, I'm, I'm staring 50 in the face and I'll tell you, my eyes are not anywhere near what they were 20 years ago. So, <clears throat> vision is a big one. Um, Color blindness, color deficiencies are, are a very obvious one. 10% of the male population is color blind. That's, that's just genetics. So you need to think about that. Uh, different cultures put different connotations on uses of colors, different icons. People have different technical experience. So all of these things factor in to your design. Right? And another interesting thought is that anybody can have color blindness under the right circumstances. Right. Um, 1991, the movie The Abyss, for those of you who were alive at the time and saw the movie, um, that, that towards the end of the movie, Ed Harris's character is down at the bottom of the underwater trench and he's trying to defuse the nuclear bomb and all he has for light is a little chemical light stick in green and they're, they're on the microphone telling him, okay, cut the blue wire with the white stripe, but, but don't cut the black wire with the yellow stripe, that'll cause the bomb to go off. And he's looking at it under a green light going, Okay, this could go either way. Um, spoiler for the 20-year-old movie, he, he figures it out. But if they had put in what we call a secondary encoding, if one of those wires had a stripe on it, wouldn't have been a problem. Right? So keeping those types of things in mind, color, uh, color deficiency being a particular one, is a, it's a real easy one to, to fix if you get it from the beginning. Rule three. Provide informative feedback. Whenever the software is doing something, um, the user should know about it. Okay, so for every action that happens, show them. If you push a button on a piece of software and it just sits there for two or three seconds, what do you do? You push it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And maybe this kicked off a, a long database search or a web cache update or, or whatever it might be. Whereas if when, as soon as the, you would push the button, you would put up a little spinner or a little message that said, you know, doing whatever I need to do, hang on, I'll, I'll be right with you, the user wouldn't get stressed out and sit there and hammer on the, the do it again button. So this is a real easy one. Provide uh, feedback, give descriptions about what can and can't be done with the software. You know, um, we're used to kind of graying out choices and saying, oh, you can't use these right now. An even better way is to provide a tool tip if something is grayed out that says why it's grayed out. You know, if you've ever tried to use an editor and something's been grayed out and you're like, I really need to use that right now and I don't know why I can't, yeah, that's an easy one. So there's a lot of little tips and tricks you can do, animations, status changes, you know, things like that to just let the user know kind of what's going on. Dialogue boxes, they're a very common um, <clears throat> particular style of user interface design. They kind of interrupt the flow of the program, quite honestly, so you should use them sparingly. When you do use them, keep in mind that they should come up for a short period of time, they should have an obvious way to use them, and an easy way to get out of them at the end, which this example doesn't. This is one of the biggest ones I want to leave you guys with, the notion of preventing errors before they happen. Okay, guiding the user towards the correct choice is a different way of doing software, but it makes a big difference. If you can prevent an error from ever happening in the first place, you don't need to put up an error dialog. Okay, think about that. By changing the way you do some coding, you don't have to pop up an error message, right? And you've made the user's life easier. Sometimes you do have to do error messages, I get it. And when you do, make sure the, the error messages are well done and kind of not worded just for engineers. Uh, Google does a real good job of, of that. 
As opposed to this, it's um, their right-click menu. Okay, if I highlight something in Google Docs and I right-click it, and I get copy on there and I select it, I get a dialog box that comes out and it basically says, ha ha, sorry, you can't do that. You have to hit control C instead. I have no idea why they do this. It drives me nuts and I, I, I've known it for years and I still trip over it. These are a couple error dialogues from, you know, real pieces of software that I've accumulated over the years. Uh, for my graduate course, I actually do a, a whole lecture towards the end called GUIs That Suck. So I've accumulated a lot of these. Uh, but they're all interesting. You know, the, the something happened one is my, my latest edition from Windows 10. I love that one. Very, very useful. Okay. Okay. Providing reversal of actions. Undo. I know it's hard. I get it. I've, I've had to put in undo systems. Architect it in from the beginning. Okay, people just expect it. You're going to have to do it at some point. Just put it in there. It makes the user's life easier. Um, even if you can't do full undo, providing some level of rollback goes a long way. Go back to last screen, restore defaults, whatever it, it might be. But give them a safety net. Okay. You want to keep the users in control. Um, if the user understands that their actions will produce something, this, you know, the same every time, it makes their life easier. Provide automation when you can. Things like autopilots for very rep uh, repetitive actions are good, as long as the end user knows they can jump in if something's going to happen that they need to care about. This will be particularly important in the age of self-driving cars. Okay, if the car is driving along and something happens that the user says, boy, I want to jump in and immediately take control, they should be comfortable that they can do that. Okay? So provide that oversight, provide uh, customization, people like that as well. And finally, and I, I know I'm going a little bit fast here, but I'm trying to keep us on, on timetable. Uh, reducing short-term memory. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple different types of working memory that people have, um, kind of long-term memory and sh volatile short-term memory. Don't make people, rem or don't make people, users especially, remember things between screens, all right? Um, phone numbers in the United States are set up with 10 digits. 10 digits can be hard to remember. Okay, there's a term in cognitive science called chunking, which says people can remember seven plus or minus two pieces of information at a time. So 10 digits is a challenge, but the first three digits are the area code. So if I see 617, I go, oh, that's a Boston number, and that becomes a chunk of information for me. And so now I just have to worry about the other seven digits, and that's kind of within my working memory. Same thing applies in software. You know, don't make somebody have to remember things between screens carry that information along. So this is one that we did at ICS um, where we had a task manager program and we were able to color code the tasks. Um, this one, we kind of set it up so that the user didn't have to go and say, did I use red somewhere already? I'll have to dig through the list. So we just nicely color coded it so it was uh, immediately available and they didn't have to go and think about it. So I know I went through that. Uh, a little bit fast. Um, if you're interested in some more information about this, go to ICS.com slash UXD. Uh, that's my team site. We've got some, uh, some interesting blog information where we did a whole series about these and we went into gory detail about each of them and kind of what they can do for you. If you're looking for a, a good book as a kind of a starting point on design, I recommend this one, The Design of Everyday Things by Donald Norman. Uh, it's been out since 1998 and it doesn't talk much about software, it literally talks about stuff, okay, just physical things. If you've ever bounced off of a door because you didn't know if it should be pushed or pulled, this is a good book for you. So <clears throat> kind of in closing, UX, um, focusing on it is a good thing. It makes your users happy and from a business perspective, it becomes your competitive advantage. Doing UX design is a slightly different animal than doing coding. It's a different skill set. You as engineers can do it. You get a few things to learn, just as if you were learning a different specialization within software. So if you want to go down this path, there's a lot of good information out there. If you want to foist it all off on a UX designer, I don't blame you, but either one's a good choice. Remember and apply from this. Know thy user, for you are not them. Be consistent in the things that you create. Your users will thank you for it. Make errors as impossible as possible. Okay? It will actually save you difficulty in the long run. Okay? And finally, design. You know, design first, design things out before you jump into the code. 
get it right on paper before you actually start coding. And that's something I talk about a lot in my more detailed class, which I didn't really cover here, but trust me, it makes life easier for you. That's all I have time for, so I'd like to thank you for your attention, and if anybody has questions, if we have any time, no, we don't have time, oh, sorry, all right. If you have questions, come find me at the ICS booth. Uh, I will be down there all day, and we will turn this over to Harry next. Thank you for your attention, everybody. Mm -hmm.